great. Welcome, everybody. It is Tuesday, September 8th, and this is the General Housing and Military Affairs Committee in the Vermont State House and the Vermont General Assembly. And we are here today continuing our conversation on S-237, which is a bill that um, affects or that makes uh, proposals to change some zoning law uh, in our statutes in different sections. Today, um, we have with us Jeff Weinberg from Rutland, Erhard Manka from um, Renewski in Burlington, and uh, Jacob Hemrick from, who's at this, in his role as uh, working at DHCD. Um, this bill, as we know, is fairly um, complex. We have heard quite a bit, both uh, verbal testimony and written testimony, and I just wanted to thank the people who have written in uh, to, to uh, share their thoughts with us. All of that information is available on our committee website and um, it proved to be extensive reading for me this weekend in trying to formulate some potential language that we can start going over perhaps as early as this afternoon, but probably tomorrow by the time we finish with testimony today of um, that reflects a lot of what I've heard and what we've heard uh, both in written testimony and in verbal testimony that addresses some of the issues that have been sticklers in this. And so um, that's what we're working on this week. Again, uh, we also did get S-254, which is a bill about union organizing that went through the Senate. Um, I know that the advocates and Tim Noonan from the Vermont Labor Relations Board worked together on to, to hammer out some language that was um, acceptable to the stakeholders. We'll hear that, about that perhaps later this week. Um, so with that, I just wanna um, start the testimony today with Jeff. Um, Jeff, if you, could, if you could just sort of give us a quick bio, um, where, you, where are you working these days? Um, because your, your BTA is certainly well-rounded. And um, if you could just let us know um, what position you're testifying, what hat you're wearing today, and um, share with us your testimony, that would be great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I do much, very much appreciate the opportunity um, to offer some comments on this legislation. Um, I'm currently serving as, and for the last six and a half years, serving as Commissioner of Public Works for the City of Rutland. Um, in various periods on and off prior to that, I uh, served as mayor of the city of Rutland in throughout the 1990s and part of the uh, 1980s when I had hair. And, um, and then between there, I also served for a little less than five years as a DEC commissioner under Governor Douglas. Um, and I've done consulting and a number of other things in the meantime and worn many hats, this is true. But today I'm, I'm uh, representing my community. And I would also like to offer just some comments or uh, illustrations of concerns uh, on uh, the, some of the other zoning provisions I have um, communicated with our zoning administrator and uh, Mayor Lair, And they have uh, authorized me to speak to those issues they are a little bit out of my sandbox in terms of uh, the public works responsibility, if that's okay. Um, the purpose of the bill is to promote access to affordable housing. As small as Vermont is, the housing affordability crisis is not a statewide problem. The legislature and the media frequently kind of assume or attribute challenges found in and near Chittenden County to uh, every Vermont region and community, but this is a classic example of that not being the case. In Rutland County, for example, households with just 80% of median household income can afford a medium priced home today. Um, and while rental uh, costs are high for a lot of people in our community, uh, they are substantially lower than they are in many other areas of Vermont. The purpose of the minimum lot size mandate in the bill is to increase the density of housing in areas served by municipal water <clears throat> and sewer. Since 2014, the city of Rutland has pursued a program of de-densification in our Northwest quadrant, which was deteriorating due to the proliferation of uh, single family homes being converted into studio and one bedroom apartments, along with uh, proliferation of absentee ownership. 
The city, the land trust, neighbor works, and Habitat for Humanity have been working to acquire blighted properties and either demolish them or renovate them into owner-occupied single and two-family homes. The program, which has a lot of other features, um, has met with substantial success, reversing the downward trend and reestablishing that neighborhood as a desirable place to both live and invest. And we have uh, public opinion surveys that we've done periodically to document this. Another goal, however, was to reduce the oversupply of rental units, um, especially the number of rental units that were not on the market, um, but uh, have been pulled off the market because of the, uh, the cost to operate them was uh, unacceptable to uh, relatively small property owners, that is ones that don't operate many, many rental units. Um, and that intention of that was to increase the value of the remaining units and en enable private investment to improve the quality of rental housing. You see, our, our biggest issue was the quality of rental housing, not necessarily the cost. My point in telling you this is to illustrate that a statewide uh, mandate designed to address affordability or encourage greater density, looking at the two sides of this from our perspective, will work to undermine the, deficits, def, the efforts at the local level where challenges lie elsewhere. And decisions such as promoting owner occupancy or addressing affordability through zoning really must be left to local governments. A one size fits all mandates can only result and inevitably will result in unintended negative consequences in some communities where the issues are different. Now on the, man, on the matter of mandated water and sewer utility mapping and municipal plans, I have two concerns. Following September 11, 2001, US EPA and the Department of Homeland Security have advised utilities to remove site-specific information about these facilities from uh, the public domain. Rutland actually had a good deal of this information on our website prior to that, but have taken it down in conformance with this advice. I've provided in my written comments a link to an EPA a publication titled Baseline Information on Malevolent Acts for Community Water Systems. That sounds kind of scary and I think it's intended to. The mandate to provide this type of information, I'm not talking about service area maps, I'm talking about detailed infrastructure maps. Uh, the, the, the mandate to provide this is contrary to the advice in that document. Now, we have no objection, as I just said, to publishing service area maps as part of the municipal plan. Actually, that's a very good idea. Um, but we do object to pipes and facilities and those kinds of, uh, that kind of information. But for smaller communities, this could, as I understand it, represent a significant cost as well. Most Vermont water and sewer utilities are very small. They serve a very small number of, uh, of customers and they typically lack the GIS mapping and digital data capabilities that we possess and that larger systems possess. So I would urge you, I'd urge the committee to heed the advice of Vermont Rural Water, Green Mountain Water Environment and the League regarding the impact of these requirements on the very small com communities and the small utilities. Now I have from time to time, as uh, I think many members are aware, sat in seats that are similar to the ones that you occupy. So I don't want to just give you a list of all the things not to do. Um, I'd like to make a few positive suggestions and here are a couple. A large reason housing costs uh, are more than many can afford in lots of Vermont is the existing state regulations which discourage construction of new uh, housing uh, by the private sector. Purchase prices and rents necessary to support new construction uh, typically can only be afforded by um, higher income individuals, leaving the, the really demand market, the market that we really want to meet, which is middle and lower income people, um, without new housing or competition uh, for housing because it's not being developed privately. Um, Section 17 in the bill calls for a statewide housing study um, really focused on the aged, but that I think could be expanded to ask for a study of state environmental and other requirements that add cost to housing development with limited environmental or other benefits. And I guess that gets um, me to the point of uh, pointing out that there's some very good examples of addressing exactly this issue 
and H926, uh, which contains the provision uh, to eliminate duplicate and costly state permits for water and sewer utility connections and uh, exempts designated downtowns from active 50 jurisdiction. I mean, those are good examples of things that um, the legislature has direct control over um, that would not interfere in and of itself and, and try to do something with zoning, which is very much a local effort um, to try to solve a problem that is not ubiquitous, although it is widespread. And I think that, that before we layer new mandates on municipalities, we should very much look to um, reduce uh, affordability or increase affordability by reducing any state requirements that um, work counter to that and that arguably um, either could be handled uh, locally or um, don't provide a benefit that justifies the burden that it imposes. So, I mean, that's, that's some of my remarks. I also uh, submitted earlier today a written version pretty close to what I just said, um, which is, I believe, available on your website right now. That's great. Thank you. Um, so one of the things that um, as, as we've spent more time with this bill, you know, one of the things that strikes me about it is that it's not, it is about affordable housing or housing that's affordable. I mean, the goal is to try to provide housing that's affordable. It's not strictly related to subsidized housing or um, it is trying to um, deregulate in some respects, especially for towns that do not have designations. And there are many that have the village designation, many more than I ever thought. Um, and there's a limited number that have the designated downtowns. So I'm just thinking, do you read um, um, any sections of this bill as deregulation for the on the local level? Um, not particularly. I, I, um, I'm trying to think now. I, I guess you could interpret some of it that way, but zoning is the is the most local of uh, kind of municipal activities. I mean, we're getting right down to the parcel level, and it really needs to remain there in order to um, serve its purpose. And I, I gave you the illustration in my remarks of of Rutland successfully de-densifying to meet other needs and to meet other demands with, with si significant success. We're very proud of that. It's been going on for quite a while. And if some of these provisions were put in that would work across purposes to any community that was facing other challenges that would not, you know, that could be met by local zoning, but would be overruled by some of the provisions, potentially overruled by some of the provisions in this bill. And I think it's a, it's a very uh, dangerous thing. I know other people, I've read other um, testimony. I know other folks, uh, local folks have testified on the issue of overwhelming um, municipal utilities by uh, substantially increasing the potential density in the service area, those kinds of things. And I know that you've already heard from folks on that. So I'm not speaking directly to that, although I could. Um, I, I really wanted to give an illustration of um, why in some places this would be kind of the wrong tool to use to try to achieve, you know, a desirable end for, for a great many. Okay, we have a couple of questions here. One from Representative Triano and then Representative Byron. Thank you. Um, welcome, Jeffrey. So I have a couple of questions. I mean, for a number of years, we, the public, have been hearing about uh, disastrous infrastructures in our larger cities and towns here in Vermont. Um, large sums of money being spent trying to track down leaks in gas lines, water lines, sewer lines, and that sort of thing. So, you know, it seems to me that, you know, mapping would be an advantage that ultimately would enable uh, cities and towns to locate their infrastructure and be able to repair them at a at a faster rate and a more economical way to do it. And then I understand the issue surrounding cost, 
But here in the Northeast Kingdom, where a large number of towns don't have that infrastructure. Um, and so, you know, my question is, what small towns and cities could be impacted um, that have um, water and sewer systems could be impacted in a, in a way that would be so negative that, again, it would um, reverse um, the uh, issues surrounding locating leaky pipes? Well, I, I would say, first of all, I completely agree with you that um, you know, we're fortunate that we have the resources and have invested very heavily in um, documenting and, and also creating computer models of our sewer collection system. And with a lot of state assistance, I might add, we've had a lot of state help from DEC on that, uh, much appreciated. And we're continuing that. Um, I don't want to get into all the specifics because I'm getting off the point. But so I, I think ha having the ability, even for very small systems, to know where their stuff is, what age it is, what condition it's in, um, you know, kind of a, a hit list of uh, future maintenance and uh, upgrades uh, based on uh, that kind of site specific invest investigations and information is absolutely critical. My objection is to making all of that detailed information generally public. So if ANR or the legislature were to uh, provide the wherewithal, especially for these smaller communities, um, to make those investments and to get that information, that is enormous benefit not only to them, it's a benefit to the environment, it's a benefit to the ratepayers. My concern only is let's not put that in a document um, that is widely available to the public. What we do, we have all, we have all GIS mapped, it's, it's pretty slick. Um, and when developers come in or uh, uh, you know, any, anybody comes in that wants to develop something, uh, open land or wants to increase uh, utilization of, a, of, a, of an existing building, we share with them any of the information that they need. It's public information, technically. So we provide that to them. But it's upon request and we know who's making the request and we pretty much know what their purpose in making the request is. And I guess what I'm saying is we're not hiding the information but we're not making it available to people that don't ask for it. So if anybody is malevolent according to EPA or, or up to mischief, uh, they would at least have to identify themselves when they sought the information and provide us with a rational uh, you know, defensible reason for needing the information, it would not be withheld for any reasonable reason, but it's it, just the idea of making it available for anybody with a with internet access and a mouse uh, is is we think is ill advised. That that clears things up for me quite a bit. I understand now. Thank you. And and Jeff, just a quick question before we get to Matt um, to Representative Byron. Does not this draft of the bill afford? A, a municipality like yours to opt out? Yes, it does. Um, there are, um, I have to say, I don't fully understand. I haven't had a lot of time to study it. Um, uh, provisions for submitting reports and that kind of thing. Um, I don't, I can't ascertain the degree of burden that those reports are uh, uh, taking advantage of the opt out provision would impose, so I really don't know. Um, but again, I, I, I think that using a zoning one size fits all mandate is going in a direction that is not gonna end well um, for Vermont. Um, again, I, I view zoning as you know, the, the most local of local activities and um, I just find it hard to believe that even with opting out and assuming a burden associated with that, which may be light, I, I honestly don't know, haven't evaluated it, um, is, is attempting to um, resolve a problem that sh should not or need not be created in the first place. Representative Byron. Thank you. Um, so I, I wanted to circle back to the comments that you made here about um, H926 and the uh, dupl uh, duplicative, duplicative cost. Wow, that was a tough one. 
Um, so with that, were you regarding to sort of like the redundancies between like municipal and state zoning? Um, the permit permit, process? Yeah, yeah. 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 So I, I had been doing a little homework on this bill over the weekend and there were some sections that were removed in the past that were sort of uh, mirrored in, in H296. And it, it appears that a multiple, uh, multiple sections that um, were taken out kind of touch on that. Have you reviewed that? Because that was most of that was about the downtown designations, the NDAs, et cetera. Yeah, I'm familiar with H296, um, 926, but um, I'm not familiar with the earlier versions of this bill. This one came I have to say is a bit of a, a surprise as it as it left the Senate. Um, we had not been following it, and I don't think the league. Uh, we've been a little busy. <laughs> uh, distracted is a good word for it. I, I like to stay more involved in um, related activities and, and initiatives going on in the legislature. But this year, it's been very difficult to do that, and no, more difficult, I'm sure, for you folks, given the constraints under which you're operating as well. Um, but we've been, we've been supportive uh, from before the COVID thing hit. And actually, I believe I offered some comments in the Senate on um, a couple of those provisions um, uh, during was a local government day in the legislature or something like that. Mm -hmm. In any event, um, the back when I was DEC commissioner, I tried to put a bullet through this thing. And because uh, it was, you know, driving us all crazy at the local level. And it was, uh, less pointless than it is now, but pretty close to pointless, except for the revenues it generates for DEC, which becomes an issue um, for sure. But in any event, um, I accepted as a compromise at that time, a change in the law, which provided a, an opportunity for communities to assume um, the responsibility of issuing the state permits along with their own as opposed to basically getting the state out of the business altogether. Um, that was a compromise figuring that um, some communities certainly wouldn't want to do that and that should be their choice, which is perfectly fine, but others, larger ones in particular, certainly might want to do that. Many had expressed the desire. The problem was when it came time to write the rules after I moved on from that position, uh, the rules were written in a way that almost no one would ever almost no community would ever take advantage of it to this date. I think these 10, 15, whatever it is, years later, only two communities in Vermont have ever taken advantage of it. And that's because the rules are written in a way to strongly discourage anybody from using that ability. That, um, I can get into the details of why that is, but I don't know that that's necessary for everybody on the committee to, 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 to hear me drone on about. So when the provo proposal came forward to, you know, revisit this and to essentially just have the state get out of the business for those communities where we have regulated uh, water and wastewater utilities. To me, that's clean. It isn't going to be undone through administrative rulemaking and um, it will provide uh, the necessary relief. The truth is the state has a legitimate and in fact, a critical interest in uh, regulating our wastewater system and specifically um, our discharge where we release the treated wastewater to Otter Creek in our case. The state has a very legitimate interest in that and they take it very seriously and DEC actually does a very good job. Likewise on the water and the state has a legitimate interest in regulating um, our treatment plant and our distribution system. Given that our permits uh, provide the state with control over those things that the state has a very clear and legitimate public interest, public health, environmental interest in, I can see absolutely no reason why the state would also have an interest in permitting individual connections to those systems. You regulate the system thoroughly and effectively. Um, an individual connection to the system should be something that the operators of the system can regulate and manage. In years past, the state used to offer service, at least for the, the wastewater side, and that they tracked uh, reserve capacity in all of the regulated wastewater plants. They stopped that years ago. Um, we now um, maintain our own records, which really should have been the case all along anyway, and I'm sure in some cases it was. Um, and uh, we are responsible for making sure that we don't overcommit 
our legal capacity in our plant. So the state doesn't even provide that service anymore. They're essentially doing nothing except adding a layer of uh, delay and cost on uh, folks who are going to be connecting to systems that are locally uh, regulated, locally operated. And we regulate those connections and then the state regulates us to make sure that we protect the environment and public health. There's no benefit there. And all it does is add cost and in our case, substantial delay to an awful lot of these very small inconsequential projects in the scheme of you know, the, the uh, ability of the systems to serve. Okay, thank you. Representative Sant, then Kalaki. Yeah, hi, Jeff. This, this may be a little outside of your area of expertise, um, but do you believe that the planning community has a consensus on um, ideal and uniform development patterns in all human habitation? And uh, let me get a little more specific. Do, are you familiar with the name Robert Moses or the phenomena of urban development? I mean, urban yes. renewal. Right, and so in that moment, for those who don't know, uh, in urban renewal, some really high-minded planners thought that they had the best idea for what how communities should be structured, and they set about to impose that vision across communities all across the United States with some pretty uh, unanticipated consequences, particularly when it comes to the notion of density of living. Uh, you probably are familiar with the proliferation of um, tenement housing and super dense uh, uh, public housing. And that has, history has shown been a, ter a disaster. So you gave a very good example of, in Rutland how this uniform approach isn't good for all communities, right? You, you set about to do de-densification for very specific purposes. Um, so do you ultimately have some concern that the state may not be the best um, purveyor of planning information and that all of the feedback that we're hearing from planners that are telling us that we need to take a different approach might be something that suits our well? Well, I, I think that was essentially, you, you've captured the heart of the concerns that I expressed in the first part of my testimony um, and that I've repeated in answer to some of the questions as well. Um, there, there are, I, I, a good example, local, right here in Rutland, and it's a, again a success story. Love to talk about those. Um, back in the Godnick administration in the 1970s, um, one of those high density. This was uh, back when families were much larger than than they are today. Um, subsidized housing developments was built in the southwest section of the city. This, the portion of the city uh, Representative Howard, you see here. Uh, represents. It was called Forest Park and uh, certainly not prone to the worst kinds of uh, problems that these in urban centers, these, these developments in urban centers have. But it had a stigma and that stigma uh, carried with it to every kid that lived there that went to school and on and on and on. Um, and the Rutland Housing Authority over a period of something like 15 years has replaced, literally demolished and replaced that uh, old and um, you know, I, I, I have to say failed um, in terms of what the real social goals are for these projects, um, that failed project with one that I think is a model. It's absolutely beautiful. The neighbors love it. Um, it is, uh, it's, it's, it's lower density, but more to the point, it, it, when you drive down the street, it doesn't scream, this is where the poor people live. Um, it doesn't do that. And uh, it, it, it is a wonderful example of what we've learned um, and how we can apply what we've learned even in a community as small as Rutland successfully. So I would agree with everything representative that you said, and I would encourage uh, the, you know, the committee and the legislature to focus on those things that are fully within your control that contribute as uh, 926 actually um, does in a couple of good, a couple of very good powerful cases 
Um, there are there are other issues relative to landlords um, and regulations on evictions. Um, I know there are there are landlords in the city that own a large number, some good ones too, thank God, um, own a large number of rental units, very good landlords. Um, who manage it in a way that, that works for them, but they find workarounds um, and they can be very expensive workarounds. And those, those costs are reflected in the rents. I mean, the rents go up because they have to work around some of the requirements that, um, that are in law. Others, people with just maybe a, a rental unit as part of their home um, uh, that have had one or two bad experiences, they just take them off the market. They they just refuse to rent them, and they you know there's nothing wrong with them. They're owner occupied for heaven's sakes. It's it, it's a good situation, but um, but a lot of those just got pulled off the market because the costs and risks associated with being a landlord um, were uh, unacceptable to them, and the the potential revenues were insufficient to put up with the uh, the risks that they. Uh, that, that they were faced with. So there are, I think, opportunities in some of those regulatory areas where we are working across purposes to affordability in rental housing. Um, and, and I think those should be studied and look for opportunities to, uh, to maybe make some of those regulatory changes. Representative Klein. Thank you, Jeff. And uh, I, uh, your memo is uh, pretty clear. And I, I have visited in Rutland, the neighborhood you're talking about, and it's a very impressive uh, renewal. But, you know, part of this bill on a higher level is about inclusionary zoning versus exclusionary zoning. And you, you talk about Rutland, but do you think Vermont has an issue with redlining? Well, I don't believe we do. I think we can say that for certain. Um, I certainly can't speak for everywhere, that's for sure. Um, I think others might be better able to speak to that. There may be some places, um, I might be able to think of one or two on hand where um, an argument could be made that um, there's exclusionary uh, uh, zoning practices taking place. Um, and, and that's, um, that's something I think the legislature should look at. I would agree with that. Um, but you know, there's there's a fine line there. You got to be very very careful uh, as to whether you are zoning uh, for communities with legislation, or whether you're you're uh, providing guidance or um, constraints, if you will within which communities can operate. And the maximum amount of um, flexibility uh, that the legislature can provide and still um, avoid the, the worst uh, abuses uh, and uh, provide the greatest benefits would be that tricky place that I would hope that you would find. Um, but yes, uh, I, I think that's probably the case in, uh, in some of our non-urban communities. Okay, thank you. I keep muting myself because there's a dog ready to bark to my right. Um, there's, um, thank you for, so much for coming in. Um, thank you for sharing your testimony with us. Feel free to stick, stay here. We have um, a couple more people to testify. Um, but I appreciate you coming in, um, especially testifying on the water aspect of things and, and, and the rest of it, of course, too. But the, um, the, um, you're free to stay and, and, and listen in. And if you have further comments, um, just grab my attention and, and uh, well, we'll see where you are. I, I, I want to thank very much the committee for uh, taking testimony in general. Um, there was a uh, uh, trying to think of a way. The Senate was not, um, to put it this way, the Senate was not as um, forthcoming or uh, open to um, the testimony in, in hindsight. And, and the House is, uh, is picking that up 
uh, in, in very good fashion with your efforts here in the committee. So thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for your service um, all over the map. And certainly Rutland is, is um, Rutland wouldn't be Rutland without you, um, oh, wow. with your service. Well, it, as long as I've lived here, you've been in the papers anyway, whether that's a good thing or not, I suppose. Um, but thank you. Um, next up, we have Erhard Manka, um, who is here to, I believe, again, Erhard, I believe your hat today is the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition. And um, the microphone is yours. Well, uh, thanks. Uh... Representative Stevens, much appreciated, appreciate the time. And yes, uh, I am here representing the uh, Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition. And also, pardon, uh, I similarly have a dog who uh, seems ever uh, about to start barking and, and uh, disrupting when I'm on, uh, on Zoom. Um, so uh, nice to see you all uh, today, if, uh, if, if remotely. Um, so I, I did follow the bill uh, and its development in Senate Economic Development. Uh, also went to all the field hearings that um, the Senate Economic Development uh, held. And um, many of the ideas I think that are incorporated in the bill uh, came about as part of uh, those extensive field hearings that were that were held um, in the in the fall. Also worked with uh, uh, Chris Cochran and other folks from the administration on uh, on aspects of the bill. And uh, overall, um, we're very supportive of uh, of this bill. Um, let me delve uh, dive right into some of the. Uh, uh, sections that have become uh, somewhat controversial and, and maybe sort of remind you um, folks that um, there is and has been a long uh, history of using government policies to discriminate against poor people, uh, to discriminate against uh, people of color uh, and other folks in protected uh, classes. And zoning has certainly been one of the ways, uh, whether intentionally in some cases and many times unintentionally um, through the use of exclusionary zoning practices uh, to have a disproportionate impact uh, on folks in protected classes that are protected under our fair housing law. Uh, and in fact, um, for people of color nationally have uh, led to uh, much lower rates of home ownership among people of color, as well as uh, also led to um, an exacerbation of wealth dispar disparities of wealth uh, for, uh, for people of color. So um, just you know, as, a, as a reminder, uh, and, and this is you know, redlining, uh, Representative Kalaki mentioned redlining, that's certainly um, something that has been one of the factors um, in, in, in what I just mentioned, as, as well as exclusionary zoning practices. And um, some of those exclus exclusionary zoning practices could be things like um, limits on, uh, on density, um, limits on um, having larger, uh, prohibitively larger lot sizes that allow only for the development of expensive housing or um, densities that are uh, such that they only allow for the um, the development of uh, of more more expensive housing that is exclusionary to uh, people of, of more modest means uh, who are disproportionately represented, in, including in our state, by people of color and, and folks uh, folks with disabilities, especially also uh, another one of the, the protected classes. Um, I'll, as you know, affordable housing challenges are multifaceted. Uh, you all as a committee have spent uh, countless hours looking at the different problems and the different challenges that we have as a state. And um, as uh, Mr. Weinberg has mentioned, certainly they are very different in different areas of the state. I think you all know that uh, probably um, the crunch or lack of, uh, of housing per se is, is much more extreme in some areas of the state than, uh, than in others. And uh, some areas like Rutland, it's, uh, it may have been disinvestment uh, and, and quality of housing. And uh, there, the focus really needs to be more on, uh, on, the, on the quality of housing. Um, there are many solutions, as you know, and they don't all involve money. Um, a lot of them do involve money. Um, you uh, folks have been uh, absolute champions for the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board and for uh, other funding sources that help create more affordable housing and that help alleviate homelessness. Um, but we also have some, uh, some solutions that um, are less related to the state or the federal government uh, providing, providing subsidies. There's no one magic bullet. 
Um, we need all the different uh, all the different strategies, all the different options, and certainly land use uh, and land use regulation and zoning uh, are 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 one of uh, are one of those. Um, and just before I um, get off the subject of um, of of uh, using exclusionary zoning to um, to, to basically or using zoning practices to exclude, whether intentionally or unintentionally. Uh, just a couple of resources for, for you all. Uh, one is a, a book that some of you may know. Uh, it's called The Color of Law by uh, Richard uh, Rothstein. It's an excellent, excellent book that really goes back to the 1930s and uh, documents just how government policies have uh, helped to uh, help to discriminate and uh, exclude uh, people of more modest means. Um, there's also a, a movie that came out uh, just last year called Owned um, that goes into some detail uh, to look at the zoning policies, the failed zoning policies, uh, especially post-war, when we just created um, tract housing uh, that you know had uh, relatively um, much larger um, lot sizes uh, and created incredible sprawl and created uh, basically the suburbs and our incredible dependence on uh, on cars and and, uh, and fossil fuels leading to you know our current uh, helping to lead to our current climate crisis and. Uh, um, uh, and the, the need to uh, sequester sequester carbon. Um, there's also, uh, to the point of density, um, certainly, uh, you know, the way some housing, uh, and, uh, especially during urban renewal and uh, during the creation of, you know, these towers of uh, uh, of, of public housing, uh, that that I would not uh, hold those up as uh, good examples of uh, of density. Uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, Julie Campoli's work here in Vermont. A book called Visualizing Density that I think in many ways creatively shows how density can be used to uh, eliminate sprawl uh, or reduce sprawl and, and also create um, denser housing that is livable and that is not like uh, the towers of, uh, of public housing that um, folks often associate with, uh, with low income housing and, and some of the, the failures uh, of, of uh, past housing, uh, past federal housing policy. Uh, so I'll just mention those as, as resources because I do think that they speak to this issue. Um, you know, generally uh, local traditional zoning does often have that exclusionary impact. Um, and if you provide greater density uh, in uh, coupled with good design uh, and coupled with uh, other uh, other tools that are available to planners through uh, through through zoning, uh, including smaller lot sizes, uh, I think um, you know you can create uh, sustainable, thriving uh, thriving communities. And and there are many many examples of that. Uh, Forest Park is 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 a great example uh, of a redevelopment that is extremely successful. And we have others uh, around the state where uh, older uh, forms of uh, public housing uh, that were developed um, in, in previous eras uh, and, and uh, have you know, been associated with some of, the, um, uh, some of the stigma that may have been attached in, in some people's minds with uh, affordable housing and, and public housing in the past uh, have been redeveloped successfully and, and uh, made much better places. Uh, I, I think this committee knows well that uh, the way affordable housing has been developed, built and developed uh, in Vermont and, and nationally for the last 30 years has really been different uh, from those old uh, those old failed policies of the past. And, and density and increased density has been part and parcel of uh, how to make that affordable, that housing more affordable, uh, not just uh, with government subsidies, but but also um, by uh, more creative and, and, and greater uh, land use. We, we certainly, uh, and I think Jacob uh, Hemrick had pointed this out in one of his slides, we do set minimums uh, for a number of different things in, in state uh, land use planning laws. Um, you know, one great example is accessory dwelling units, which um, the state minimums for accessory dwelling units are proposed to be changed during this to make it uh, easier to develop uh, accessory dwelling units and, and uh, um, more, more difficult uh, for local opposition to, uh, to prevent their, their development. Uh, also mobile home parks, uh, you, there's through state uh, land use planning law where um, no community is allowed to de facto um, prohibit uh, or create, prohibit the, um, the um, development of, of uh, mobile home parks. Um, there's also minimums uh, around, uh, you can't uh, eliminate or, or prohibit uh, multifamily. So 
residential care uh, is, is another example or, or group homes. So there are a number of ways in which we establish minimums in, in state uh, land use planning. And so I would encourage you to um, look at smaller lot sizes uh, and greater density to promote infill development uh, and to promote the creation of more affordable housing. Clearly helps lower the cost and uh, promotes the development of, of much needed additional housing, not just affordable housing. Um, I'll, I'll, as another example, uh, I mean, I think we do need in this uh, uh, national crisis of affordable housing, and, and uh, you know, as long as I've been involved, it's, there's been a crisis in affordable uh, and quality housing in the state of Vermont. Uh, we need bold solutions, and so I would encourage you to look at uh, some of the sections that have uh, generated controversy among planners and, and uh, some um, uh, and the league and, and uh, some other municipal uh, representatives. Um, as an example of a bold solution, I'll cite that uh, the city of Minneapolis has eliminated uh, single family zoning uh, in order to address its uh, affordable, affordable housing crisis. These are the kinds of uh, bold solutions that uh, planners all across the country are looking at and that I think Vermont needs to look at um, as well. Um, does that mean that we're absolutely wedded to the language that's in uh, S-237? I would say no. I, you know, the planners that have um, commented, uh, there have been many good solutions for how to, uh, good ideas rather, uh, for how to um, tweak uh, some of the proposals that are in, uh, especially in section uh, 2B. And I would encourage you to look at those. I, I know time is tight uh, and uh, you're scheduled to adjourn uh, by September 25th at the, at the latest, I believe. Um, so I, I do hope you have uh, time to look at those. Uh, some of those, um, those suggestions, I, I, I think there's uh, some good ideas uh, that, that I would encourage you to look at and, uh, and integrate into the bill during um, during your, your markup. I, we do understand uh, some of those concerns, but I wanna make sure that uh, you understand that um, some of these bold solutions are necessary, uh, even if um, you need to modify them somewhat based on uh, some of the other concerns you've heard. Um, you've taken testimony and, and read about the off-ramp. Uh, I do understand, we do understand the concerns uh, for municipalities to lose uh, the priority for, um, for resources, um, but there is an off-ramp and I encourage you to maintain an off-ramp uh, if you need to tweak the language on that and uh, change that uh, to adapt to some of the concerns. I, I, I think that's, that's um, a good thing to do, um, but I'll just remind you that for these, uh, for the kinds of minimums that, that are um, proposed, uh, there is an off-ramp and there is a way for um, municipalities uh, for legitimate reasons um, to, uh, to buy out. Um, I do have some comments on a couple of other uh, sections of the bill that I'd, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, provide you with. Um, one is uh, to incur to, to support the idea of uh, enabling towns to um, greater regulate short-term rentals. I, I would say moving forward, and maybe this is something for next winter, uh, I do think greater state regulation uh, is warranted uh, on a statewide basis and, and would encourage uh, this committee uh, and your Senate counterparts to look at that uh, during the next session. But for, for uh, right now, uh, providing clear authority for towns to um, regulate short-term rentals um, in, in a way that may be more, uh, more stringent um, than, than uh, the current state regulation, I think is, uh, is a good thing. Um, I'd also like to speak uh, briefly to the uh, mobile home uh, section, the mobile home park section um, in the bill, and remind you, um, in addition to Sue Fillion's uh, testimony from uh, Brattleboro Town Planning last week, uh, you did before you uh, left Montpelier due to the pandemic, you heard uh, testimony from folks uh, from Tri Park uh, Mobile Home Park. Um, and the language that's in the bill is absolutely critical, especially for Tri Park, but not just for Tri Park. Uh, it's also critical for other mobile home parks that uh, see uh, and have acute infrastructure needs. Uh, the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board did uh, commission a study uh, in the summer. It was uh, delivered in the summer of uh, 2019, so just over a year ago, uh, that identified millions of dollars of uh, infrastructure needs in mobile home parks, which uh, specifically go towards uh, their sustainability their viability and their uh, continued affordability. 
Tri Park because it's still trying to recover from uh, some of the impacts of uh, Tropical Storm Irene. Uh, I would say it's probably has the largest single set of needs and the most acute. Um, the bill originally had $750,000 identified um, that was stripped out in Senate appropriations. Uh, I know it's too late to get that back in on the House side, but um, I am hopeful that uh, there may be room uh, for that on the on the Senate side. Uh, those would be for um, the most critical needs. One is a replacement of a bridge um, that was destroyed, uh, that is was rendered um, inoperable by uh, Tropical Storm Irene um, uh, and, and uh, two um, sewage uh, system upgrades that are, uh, that are absolutely critical uh, to the tune of about $750,000. Um, that said, uh, without the money, the language that's in the bill is absolutely vital, vital uh, to restructuring uh, and hopefully mm -hmm. actually forgiving uh, the current loans that they already have, uh, which would help with their cash flow uh, and with the restructuring of, uh, of, their, of their debt. I know you received some testimony from uh, Commissioner Walk. Uh, I do believe there may have been some misunderstanding around uh, clearly the um, state water and sewer funds that uh, are referenced in the language section um, were not intended to be used for relocation of uh, mobile home uh, lots out of uh, the, the floodplain. Um, and if that language and that, that provision needs to, that those words need to be stricken uh, to clarify um, that I, I'd be happy to work with you on the, on the language. Um, as well as uh, with DEC, but that was not the intention. The intention is um, for uh, DEC to look at, for ANR to look at, um, hopefully the forgiveness of existing loans to help with the um, the restructuring of of their debt and and their cash flow. Uh, and I did um, over the weekend look at the uh, federal underlying statute, and it's quite clear that the federal underlying statute does allow for complete uh, forgiveness of, uh, of existing loans in, uh, in, certain, in certain circumstances. So I would encourage you um, to um, not uh, adopt the language that Commissioner uh, Walk has, um, has proposed and, and uh, not to get into the details of that language, but um, would, would be happy to work with you um, when you get into a markup of that. Um, the other thing I'll uh, just quickly reference is that there was also money in the bill for planning. Um, and that um, that unfortunately also was removed when uh, the bill went from your Senate counterparts into uh, Senate appropriations. And to do um, the work that is um, being proposed around uh, zoning, I think um, at some point additional funding uh, will would be needed. And I'll, uh, I, I know this committee knows well that uh, the uh, property transfer tax is also one of the sources for municipal and regional planning. And of course that does get rated um, there as well as through Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. So additional money uh, uh, would be good to uh, include in the bill. Um, I'll also uh, mention in, uh, uh, Mr. Weinberg mentioned this as well, um, the uh, Act 250 exemption provisions that were originally in uh, S-237 and then um, in the Senate got moved into uh, the Act 250 bill, H-926. And now that bill um, is, uh, well, they've been removed from that bill. These are provisions that we strongly support. Uh, we strongly support uh, eliminating duplicative Act 250 uh, review in designated downtowns and in neighborhood development areas uh, because that all, we, we want to be able to promote uh, housing and other development in uh, the areas where we want them, uh, not in our more rural areas. And uh, we support that uh, coupled with uh, some of the uh, provisions that were in H-926 that um, provide greater protections for natural areas, uh, including uh, trails and, and forest, uh, the for trails and forest fragmentation provisions. So uh, I don't know if there's uh, time for you folks to um, look at uh, those sections that were removed and then temporarily put into 926 in the Senate, and now they're out again, uh, if, if you have time to look at that, but that is something that we would encourage you to uh, look at. Uh, lastly, I understand there's some conversation that uh, H739, the rental, um, the rental housing safety bill, uh, may be added to uh, to this uh, to make it a more comprehensive housing package, and we would encourage you very strongly to do that. Uh, I'm 
uh, together with uh, Sarah Carpenter, and Wendy Morgan, and others that you've heard from uh, a member of the Rental Housing Advisory Board, um, and have actually been working on this issue for as long as I've been uh, an advocate at the State House. So for over 20 years, uh, we have, uh, as you heard from Mr. Wenberg and, and from others, uh, we have rental housing that is in uh, bad need uh, of, of improvement. We have tenants living in deplorable situations. And now during COVID more than ever, we could have used, for example, the rental housing registry that's included in that. Uh, instead of putting 2000 folks in motels uh, to, so that they would have a, a, a home to stay safe in, uh, some of those folks could have gone directly into permanent housing if only we had known uh, where all of the affordable, where, excuse me, where all the rental housing, privately owned rental housing was in, in our state. Um, and certainly that was something post Irene that would have been uh, good to, or during Irene, uh, during recovery would have been good to know, but even more so now uh, during COVID and during the pandemic, it would have been good to know that. Uh, likewise, the rental housing stabilization program that you all uh, stood up and provi provided the uh, funding for uh, through the Coronavirus Relief uh, CARES Act uh, funding to the Vermont State Housing Authority. I mean, it would have been so much easier to be able to communicate directly uh, with the private property owners around the state to let them know about this uh, this resource uh, so that they could cover some of their losses uh, that they have seen because uh, tenants have not been able to pay the rent during the, the pandemic. So just for so many different reasons, um, the different aspects of that bill, uh, I think, are, are, are important. And I've listened with interest on uh, to some of the concerns and, and criticisms that uh, members have had. But I, I would say, uh, you know, if not now, uh, when? When will we finally do this? I've been working on uh, similar bills for over tw for 20 years. Um, there was one that passed the House in 2008. That was 12 years ago. Here we are 12 years later. This is the closest that we've come. Uh, I think uh, you can change some of the dates in it uh, for sure. It you know, clearly would not be implemented immediately. We have to get past the pandemic, but I think setting, uh, setting the wheels in motion to get this passed is something that uh, actually both tenants and landlords in the state of Vermont uh, deserve and, uh, and need. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. Um, and uh, thank you again for the time. Uh, if folks have questions, uh, happy to answer any that I can. All right, Erhard, take a deep breath now. <laughs> that was all on one breath. Um, I have a question from Representative Byrong and then Hango. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, Erhard, you, you actually kind of answered or touched on what my question was gonna pertain to. Again, I was circling back to um, the sections that were removed from this and put in H926 um, around the zoning uh, for the downtowns and the NDAs. So essentially, like you're, you are seeing that as, as a way of promoting more expedient and more affordable housing development in the areas that we're looking to, you know, promote growth in is essentially what I'm hearing, right? So uh, yeah, that that that's a, a yes with the proviso that, you know, uh, in a 926, there's a balancing act. Uh, and so we want to concentrate the development in those areas. And at the same time, uh, which provides, you know, relief to um, some of our more rural areas where we don't want to see development in, you know, uh, on prime ag lands, on, uh, you know, in, in important natural areas. So there's a balance and there's components of 926 that go to things like uh, you know, trails, forest fragmentation, and additional protections. So, uh, you know, the way I've seen those is as a package, uh, but unfortunately they, um, you know, only part of that package is now in the Senate version of, of 926. No, no, no I, I completely agree with your point. I think I, I've watched that bill um, kind of hit that wall the same way you did and feel that those components that are still moving are very, very important ones to keep momentum up on. Um, and I was going to try and discuss a little bit later in the day with the committee to uh, take a look at these provisions that were removed, these sections that were removed, but you touched on it before I could say something. So I just wanted to use this as an opportunity to say that I would strongly recommend request um, that we do in fact take a, take a hard look at these sections because um, I, I agree with everything you said, Aaron. All right. Thank you, Representative Henko. I think I prematurely raised my hand, so I'm I'm good now. Thank you. 
should be a little red hand that can be put up. Um, um, Erhard, a couple of specific questions to the policies. We heard your support for, you know, in general terms, but um, some of the questions, some of the areas that um, uh, when we talk about, you know, we have to change things or we need different language or something like that. I'm just curious about your take on, um, let's go to ADUs for as, as as an example, um, I mean, I know that most of the most of the questions are about about the lot size and lot density, and and there is language that's that um, people have shared, and I put together a draft of potential uh, concepts that may address some of the things that you're talking about. But one of the things that stood out to me was that in the ADUs was um, traditionally. ADUs are supposed, right now, ADUs are supposed to be attached or pertinent to uh, a property. So mother-in-law apartment, a carriage house um, that's been renovated and so on. And, and this bill proposes to allow it to be a separate house. So for instance, I live on 0.33 acres uh, in downtown Waterbury. I have access to water and sewer. Our water and sewer system has enough um, capacity to handle another unit like this. Um, I may have some effluvial problems in my backyard, but perhaps if I build it up eight feet, um, it'll be fine. But there's nothing in this bill outside of allowing municipalities to create bylaws on short-term rentals. I could, I mean, this bill tells me that I could build this building um, and rent it as a short-term rental, can't I? Yeah, that that's that's a potential problem, um, and you know it's something that uh, I know Burlington. I haven't followed it closely, but I know Burlington is um, is 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 going through um, uh, in terms of greater regulation at the local level for accessory dwelling units. So yeah, no, I I, I think uh, creating uh, an ADU just for it to be a short term rental um, that that kind of defeats the purpose because creating an ADU, uh, the point is we want to en enhance, uh, we, we want to have uh, a greater number of, uh, of homes. And, you know, it also provides some rental income for the, the for the homeowner um, and could be the thing that helps uh, get a, a, a young family into, uh, into how into their own, uh, their own housing into owned owned housing. Um, much the way duplexes are uh, often a way for uh, families to begin to uh, to enter uh, home ownership. So I, I I think that's that that is a potential problem. And and I know that's picking at you know it's it's picking at it because I know that the intent is not to have a series of of short term rentals being built in people's backyards, but to create again more housing that's affordable. Um, the other the other issue um, that I wanted to get your thinking on was that some of the planners and I'll use Stowe as an example because their example was so um, it stood out. I'll just say it stood out where they said, "Well, we have this water and sewer system that you know ha having access to wastewater capacity in particular is." something that allows development and some can some people could say sprawl and they developed a system where they had a village system and they brought it up to the top of the mountain for specific business purpose and they ended up with five miles of of um road front that in their interpretation of these of this law it allows for the bylaw you know that they would be able to create or they might be forced to create 51,000 um, eighth acre lots. And, you know, one of the potential solutions in or proposals put forward is like, well, if we just limit the uh, development to the down, the designated downtowns or a certain percentage of a of distance from a from an associated downtown or a neighborhood development. What, in your knowledge, I mean, there's a practical thing that says to me, well, I don't know that they'd have the capacity for 51,000 units. We'd have to rebuild Route 100. Um, there's a lot of other things that go into it, but I totally understand their point. They're, dry, they're trying to extrapolate and try to bring it to, to the nth degree in order to create, a, um, to illustrate a point. But are there not, in the circumstances like this, are there not 
overlaying development districts or are there not existing tools that you're aware of that would prevent them from doing that? That would allow them on the local level so that it's not a cookie cutter situation to develop the rules and regulations that they would need without also creating this element that we've talked about that of redlining. Um, you know, is, is, is there not already existing tools that allows them to say, well, we want development in this place and we want it in this place. We don't want it in between, even though we know we built this line. You know, I'm going to defer to, I'm, I'm not a planner. I, I spent a fair amount of time on a planning commission here in Burlington and, you know, have been involved in housing development and Act 250 and um, the more distant past. I would defer to, you know, Jacob or, you know, Chris Cochran or some of the planners um, uh, that uh, I'm sure can come up with a solution. Certainly, um, you know, we have this system of designated er designation areas uh, whether it be downtowns or neighborhood development areas, growth centers. Uh, and one of the things that was in H926 um, was uh, to also provide an exemption to enhanced village centers, as long as there's some inclusivity provisions for affordability in them. Uh, you know, that's something that I would say we would we would promote. I don't know the specifics around uh, Stowe, but I, I just can't imagine, um, given the wealth of tools that are available to folks uh, in the planning community through zoning, uh, that they're they're couldn't be some way of avoiding that sort of worst case scenario um, that uh, that I know some um, uh, some folks have, um, uh, have have expressed concerns about. So Jacob, if you're still there, how are you? Thank you for sticking around. So um, I, I think one of the things that happens when we, especially as we dig down into bills and we try to understand them point by point, um, we lose sight of the larger forest um, for the particular trees that we're, that we're looking at. And I think we're at a point now with this bill, and especially in what is admittedly the most difficult section in the bill of, uh, you know, losing sight of what the bigger pictures are. I mean, I think that there's, um, and as we head into potential markup and discussions about, you know, the details that we're going to go through, and then what we need to go through on this bill. Um, I was wondering if you had anything left, you know, from your testimony or perhaps from what you've been hearing today that you can add that sort of gives us a different or a fuller context of where, of where we are when we talk about each of these separate things. I mean, we could be talking about lot size and lot density, but we don't know what the statute is on either side of what we're proposing to change. I'm just wondering if there's any, if there's any notes that you've taken over the last couple of days that you participated and listened that, um, that either raise a flag or the, the, the areas that we should look at while we're, as we embark on, on trying to sort through all the proposals. Yeah, thank you, Representative Stevens for the record, Jacob Emmer from the- You could do a volume, do you have volume? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much with the Department of Housing and Community Development. Am I coming through okay now? Yeah. Yes, yeah, it's, uh, it's the best I can do. So. Okay, I guess I guess you have to, I'm sorry, talk more slowly so we can, and loudly so we can understand. Uh, I, I apologize. Yeah, so I, I think there has been some really credible uh, concerns raised about um, uh, avoiding development in flood hazard, fluvial erosion and river corridors, avoiding natural resources, um, and, uh, and recognizing that there can be capacity limitations on water and sewer lines. Um, just zooming out for a second and thinking about the big picture of this bill again, you know, the housing problems we have in Vermont um, persist in ways that are really difficult to spend our ways way out of. And we all know people that struggle to afford a home in Vermont or I know I know friends who have left Vermont young couples with kids because they can't working class people who can't afford to live here so the average listing price of a home in Burlington is four hundred and twenty five thousand dollars right now in Barrie we have very you know where I am today very affordable homes um, but many requiring very substantial investments in code um, to, uh, so they don't, don't necessarily, at the end, after you purchase them, a purchase price may be affordable, but the home actually isn't affordable. Um, and this is all about uh, 
steering development opportunities for housing in and around centers where there's infrastructure, water, wastewater investments, and expanding opportunities for small scale development, especially by individuals and not only um, big developers. And I think the main point of this is if we continue to, to pattern match uh, and to continue to do what we're doing, are we going to see a change in Vermont's housing market, in Vermont's housing picture? And a lot of, a lot of smart minds have uh, weighed in on this bill. I think you know, the, the Planning Association has made many good suggestions. And I think on the whole uh, have uh, uh, provided support for many of the provisions of this bill. And I think there could be with some, with some fixes um, to where it applies, um, it could be made uh, even, even better. And to your scenario in Stowe, Representative Stevens, um, I think you know, municipalities have many tools at their disposal to, uh, to steer development and, and really three things drive uh, development. I think it's transportation investments, water and sewer investments, and your land use. Um, and, and finding a way to thread uh, the um, expanded opportunities for smaller lots, for more density, for a, a, a more diverse housing types in the right location um, is the way to go. And so deciding, I mean, I think what we're hearing is that is part of, uh, and anybody who's listening in can, can correct me if I'm wrong, but what I'm hearing is to, in opposition to this is that, is that um, local, uh, municipalities still want to be the ones who determine where, where the right place is. And I think supporters of the bill are saying, well, they already do that. They already can do that. They, this won't change that to a difficult degree. I mean, all of the communities who have to follow particular, there, there's so many levels of zoning that you have to follow um, from, from, you know, if you're, if you're in a designated downtown to if you have wetlands in your, in your neighborhood. I mean, there's lots of things that limit the development. Um, how do, you know, how do we buy, how do we, how do we play with that? How do we try to like suss that out and, and say, well, what's, you know, except to say that this bill does offer an out, right? It does say, if you don't think that you can manage this, if you think that you've studied this and you can't do it, not so much that you won't, but that you can't, then you can, you can apply for, then you can apply for, um, a, uh, to get out of this um, or to be exempted from this. Am I reading that correctly? That's, that's my understanding, yes. And when it comes to, um, again, we're gonna, we're gonna spend more time tomorrow reviewing, you know, some, some proposed changes that were aggregated from different resources. And so it's just, I just wanna leave us with, with the ideas, you know, that, um, I mean, I, did, you know, did you know this bill when it had all of the Act 250 provisions in it? Yes. Um, and would I be mistaken in thinking that plugging in sections, and I don't know what Representative Byron had in mind and we'll hear him out. Um, but are they, you know, what were they addressing? That why were they pulled from this particular, why were they separated in such a way from this bill? To, to your knowledge, not to your, not in a, I guess, you know, how, how would you imagine, you know, that the reasoning why they did this? Yeah, I, I can't speak to the intent of the Senate, but they were, uh, as I understand, amendments from the floor to separate to separate the two bills. I, you know, I, I don't know why they were separated. What were the elements that were pulled out that uh, that, that interplay with this bill? Yeah, so there were exemptions um, to Act uh, from Act 250 in uh, neighborhood designated areas and downtown areas, um, and. There were also the uh, water wastewater permitting features that uh, 
um, Public Works Commissioner Winberg uh, spoke about. Uh, there were, uh, I believe the, um, uh, I'm gonna pause on, pause on that. I think those were the three main features that, uh, that were pulled out. Okay, and I saw Ellen for a second um, poke her head up and I just wanna, um, is that, is that, I mean, again, I, I, we, this has always been portrayed to us as having interplay with the sections that were pulled out. And, you know, we've tried to limit our conversation because, I, I, you know, one side of me says, well, if we start adding in other sections from 926, well, then this bill's actually going to have to go to over to natural resources because that's, you know, that really strikes at what their portfolio is. And these are the sections that come closest to ours. Um, Ellen, is is Jacob on track there, or can you shed any light? Sure. So Jacob is right. There were um, Act 50 provisions related to exempting downtowns and neighborhood development areas from Act 250. There were also provisions related to municipal and state wastewater permitting. There were also some changes related to the requirements to become a designated downtown or neighborhood development area. Um, specifically in the neighborhood development area section, there was um, new language new language regarding infill in uh, flood hazard areas and river corridors, um, as well as um, some tie-in provisions that related to if these areas were going to be exempt from Act 250, some additional affordable housing provisions that would be required. Um, you may want to hear from the Senate as to why they were pulled, um, but I think you do know that H926 was moving and there were nearly identical provisions in that bill as there were in this bill. Okay. So I think. Yeah, I think it's a little late for why, you know, I mean, obviously it was something that happens um, and we're dealing with what we have to deal with. I mean, I, I do express some concern just about making sure that when we mark this up that we're not going to be, um, making an imbalance as to what's going on in the other bill. Uh, and um, also just as an aside there, this S-237 visited a number of committees in the Senate and there actually were multiple um, deletions as you see. So the Senate Appropriations Committee also took out um, the entire appropriation section that was um, making a number of uh, appropriations for municipal planning grants, as well as some of the other um, housing programs, including technical assistance for ADUs and something else, VHIP money maybe. So uh, there are, there was the, this bill went through many revisions in the Senate before it got to you. Right, my understanding in the Senate, in the classic sense of, I mean, we won't know until the end of the session if the money gets put back in. But but my understanding was that the money was taken out because um, because they were well one of the reasons was because we were only working on the first quarter budget and that you know that was one of the reasons that I, that was shared with me whether there's larger um, policy reasons for doing it or budgetary requirements that you know that said we're not going to fund it because I think we've heard from a lot of the communities that doing anything that changes bylaws requires some financial support for planning grants. And, mm -hmm. um, and I think we would support, I, I mean, I don't want to keep my fingers crossed, but I would, I would think we would support obviously making these grants available if it's, if it's possible. Um, all right. Um, I thought I had a question for Jeff Winberg, but um, I don't Re representative Zott. Well, I was uh, curious, I guess a fiscal note isn't quite what I'm looking for, but do we have any data that uh, projections for how many units of housing this bill uh, will accomplish? And, it, and, uh, and if we don't have that data, who, if the housing doesn't follow from this change to our zoning, 
who will come back before the committee? I won't be here, but who will come back before this committee and say, yep, we were wrong. We thought that this, this set of changes would increase affordable housing and it hasn't materialized. Is there any way anybody can be held any kind of account of, have any kind of accountability on this or are we just sort of surmising that the market uh, with its with the tweaks that we're we're putting here will lead to this affordable housing because we did we did receive testimony today from Essex from the planning staff in Essex and Essex Junction and their conclusion at the end I'll call attention to the committee it says the bill proposes some useful approaches to zoning reform that might underlined encourage housing production, which underlined might lead to increased affordability. And it goes on to say it, however, it may not do so. Um, so anyway, I guess my question is, if we don't have the data, uh, are we just sort of looking and crossing our fingers or what exactly is driving the belief that this will lead to more affordable housing for Vermonters? Um, I think quickly we're in a position where we're creating there's 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 several elements to this bill of course one is that we're we're creating a statement that says um, through zoning that um, we're, we're not supportive of exclusionary zoning and we want to see more inclusionary zoning developed throughout the state especially in areas that are not affected by act 250 provisions um, or that are I'm sorry that are affected by act 250 provisions that um, that may not be downtowns or designated downtowns. Um, using the word might is correct. I mean, housing gets developed by developers. So they need to be able to make the investments and part of this bill, I believe has an element of deregulation in it that should make it easier for people to approach project and make it more financially feasible. There's no promise that, that more housing gets built. There's no, um, you know, this isn't this isn't a give or um, uh, a, a plan for affordable housing organizations that we work with to have a leg up or to develop more properties. They may, if they're able to raise the money and do it and get the correct zoning and get the permits that are that are still necessary in place. So I don't think that it's about promising that there are set units, that there are a number of units. It's about putting into place, a first of all, a policy with some provisions, with some legal provisions that would encourage people to build in those ways. And certainly as to who's accountable for what, um, uh, that's, you know, in terms of our work, laws are, laws are constantly changing. Things obviously work and then don't work um, or they, they are tested and don't work. But in terms of each, this is, you know, I think the, I think the, the highest level intent with this bill, no matter its flaws or no matter the um, support and or opposition to this is that the, this is to say that we are going to um, support this kind of zoning and do it in ways that we find meaningful. And sometimes the way that we find meaningful are, are planning grants or are some kinds of exemptions. Um, so that, I, I don't know that that gets to exactly what you're asking, but that's my take on it. Uh, yeah, no, that gets to it. And it's you, as you know, Chair, uh, being pedantic is a specialty of mine. Um, so uh, I just sometimes like to be precise. And when you started referring to the bill in subsequent meetings as a zoning bill, I was much more comfortable with referring to it as a zoning bill. Or we do have data in terms of dense development, in terms of its environmental impact. We have that. So if we want to talk to it about uh, in terms of being maybe an environmentally friendly housing bill, or encouraging environmentally friendly housing, I, you know, I'm much more comfortable with um, with that language. But to call it an affordable housing bill, I think, is a bit of a of a, a misnomer, and it's so that's just why I was raising that because it just a little bit makes me uncomfortable. And then finally, when we talk about redlining, part of the problem here that I'm also uncomfortable with is when we connect it to this kind of moral argument around redlining, but then we allow communities to opt out, it feels like we're trying to kind of have it both ways. We talk about how important this bill we need to prevent this sort of morally reprehensible practice, but then we say, oh, but you don't have to participate in the program. So we should either make it like absolutely mandatory with no opt outs, opt outs if it's really geared towards addressing redlining, or we shouldn't talk about it in terms of redlining either. Um, uh, there's a, there's a fair point there. I think that it's, um, 
you know, to the, I, I mean, we have nothing to do with the titling of the bill. This is how it came over and it said affordable housing. I think as I, you know, I, it, it becomes more about housing that's affordable. And I think that that's, it, that comes from being able to build more housing. You know, that just, to, that to me is the simplest addition. Um, but as far as the reporting, you know, the opting out part, yes, uh, you know, there's, there are elements that are times we've been told that, you know, there's a cookie cutter approach to this, that, that we can't make it all one size. And so the Senate in their wisdom put in this opt out um, provision that if you look at the language of what this, this substantial um, report is going to do is that, you know, the, 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 the municipalities have to make their reports According to what I've heard, the reports themselves won't necessarily be onerous. The applications to be opting out won't necessarily be onerous, but the information will be collected by the department and ostensibly over time will be uh, collected in such a way that says, well, community A felt like this and community B felt like they couldn't do it because of this and community C felt like they couldn't do it because of this. And at some point, will that be used to formulate further policy? You know, that's, that's, that makes it useful. Um, but in terms of taking a, you know, if, if you want to make an argument about a, a uh, or have a discussion about a higher moral stand, I think that's, that's fair too. Um, but I think in all legislation, when we're trying to thread a needle between creating good policy and then listening to the comments that are being made by, by the people who actually have to implement this, um, you know, we, we take, we put compromise on the table all the time. Um, that's all. It's, it's you know, it's a it's a fair point. Representative Hango, your hand has been up for some time. Thank you for waiting. Thank you. Um, I am. I'm concerned about this bill in in many ways. Um, one of the biggest concerns I have, I raised last week, and I called it, I guess, mistakenly cookie cutter, but you could call it one size fits all because I've heard other people refer to it as that um, small village that has municipal water and you build the buildings, people come, there are no services besides that municipal water for those people. I'm, I'm very concerned about encouraging people to live in lower cost areas that are served by water and or sewer and have nothing else available for those people. So that's concerning, particularly because the municipalities that we have who have greater services, greater access to services may be higher cost and those folks may not be able to live there um, for whatever reason. So um, I'm, I'm afraid of changing our rural landscape and creating little mini municipalities just because there is water and maybe sewer also. Um, no grocery stores nearby. That's a big problem up in my area. So that that concerns me. The Essex planners, um, if you read your letter from them, do have some very important points and I'm glad that they brought those up. And particularly it was around what Representative Sot just, just brought up, the might you can build these buildings or not and people may or may not buy them people may or there may be no demand for them so um i really do believe that this is not an affordable housing bill i really do believe it's a zoning bill i don't really believe that it belongs with us um i'm i'm concerned very concerned about all the changes it went through in the senate before it got to us and the fact that it was passed out so quickly at the very end of the session. And it's up to us to make it a good bill. That's very concerning to me. So I obviously have a lot of concerns about this bill and I'm not certain that we're going to be able to fix all of them in the short time that we have and give it a well thought out response. Thank you. All right. Um, being conscious of time, it is 4.32. Um, that's our technical ending time, but we do, we can stay longer if there's further conversation on this bill. Um, 
Jeff, are you still there? Oh, and Representative Trano has a has his hand up. Go ahead, Jeff. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Chip. Uh, just comments. I mean, I've got all this these things running around in my head after all this testimony and this. And you know, um, I've lived up on the mountain for 48 years here, and we have we do have zoning. Um, we have lot sizes, and we but we have no municipal water or sewer. But you know, I grew up in a, a in the rural borough of New York City, Staten Island. When I was a child, there were wetlands, there were um, there were forests and and working farms. Mariana lived there. She she knows what I'm talking about. You're nodding your head. So you know, I lived through Robert Moses and his disastrous um, uh, you know uh, projects uh, that he built. But you know, he was also known for um, bringing roads uh, to uh, gain access to outlying areas uh, through neighborhoods that probably, in 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 in, uh, in, in retrospect, should not have happened. Um, you know, he was followed by uh, Robert Lindsay's administration, who did an awful lot for parks and uh, and, um, and and municipalities. But you know, on Staten Island, um, the developers who just bought up tons of farmland where uh, truck farms used to be growing beautiful produce for the local people and put little pink houses everywhere and it was a disaster an absolute disaster so when i think in terms of trying to uh, confine um, you know development to um, uh, bring about more affordable housing um, you know all these things just run through my mind in some disastrous zoning and 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 uh and development that has happened in my lifetime so you know i think in terms of you know using uh downtown areas or designated areas i should say to um promote this type of development uh, which does does have inter infrastructure to accommodate it um, it seems to make sense to me. I think that if we are, are, are in Vermont or at risk of losing green pastures and black and white cows, we will really lose the character of our state. And that is that would be a disaster. Um, and so, you know, I, I just I just think that preventing urban sprawl is really a very, very serious issue that we need to uh, accommodate and we need to take up. I just, I guess I'm rambling, but, <laughs> but, you know, these are experiences that I've had in my lifetime and they are, they really, um, uh, have a, an impact, uh, on the way I think. And so, you know, I, I support this bill. I think that, you know, whatever we can do to prevent urban sprawl and little pink houses everywhere, um, is really an important issue uh, that we need to be taking up at this point. Thank you. Representative Casals. I, I'm, I keep thinking about all of the different factors and that if we were in 3D, uh, this might be time for the whiteboard um, where we are looking at the different pieces of, of this um, bill and then the different options that, that, that have been presented to us. So the, um, the water and sewer lines are the one that, that the last few folks have just mentioned um, as one of those, those um, multiple things that are on the table. And so that's what the bill currently says. And then we've heard different proposals from different people um, uh, on that. And so that um, I have an insect that keeps kind of being around my face. Um, so I apologize. <laughs> uh, um, but that's that's what keeps coming to my mind of if we if that can be kind of the next step. And so a little kind of pre markup, if you will, um, that uh, because I'm I'm hearing on some of the pieces there's um, some uh, folks that agree with some parts and other gro groups of folks that agree with different parts on different parts of the bill. Um, so that's, that's I, I don't know exactly how we would do that um, in the, the 2D space that we're in, but that is, that is something that is coming to my mind of maybe it's time to chart out our different options. No, thank you. I wish um, we'll see if we can manage something like that but one of the things one of the ways that, that this committee's been successful in dealing with bills especially with multiple sections is to like go through do a quick do a quick go through 
and say this was a problem session this was a problem section this this one's not this one's not this one's not this let's not forget what's in this one you know but then just sort of keep blocking off the sections um until we get down to the you know knock off the easy ones if, if there's any easy ones and then really be able to focus the rest of our time on on the more difficult sections and we'll see how far we go you know short of short of like writing it down on a big board um, you know, that's one way I'm looking at, um, how we, de how we deal with the markup and, and, and I mean, markup to me, it is it, at least starting tomorrow is going to be pre markup. I think there's a lot of discussion that we still have to, um, get to, but that's, that's the way I want to approach tomorrow anyway, um, is to really just sort of say, do we have a problem with this? And if everybody says no, good you know, no one, if no one, and that's going to be the back end of the bill. But I think even the back end of the bill has had some, you know, some issues um, that we just need to deal with. So um, Representative Kalaki, did you have your hand up? Did you want your hand up? Thank you, Chair. I, I took it down. All right. Well, in the, um, so I'm going to go ahead and adjourn for today. I think we're full. Um, I'd like to thank Jeff Wenber for coming up from Rutland, um, and for Jacob to, for sitting in, uh, and Earhart for, for coming back in. Thank you for your testimony. Um, again, we are, everybody, I, I sent you something that I haven't posted yet. We'll post it, I suppose, tomorrow. The, the stuff that I sent are... I consider that capital D, capital R, A, F, T drafts. Um, it's just, I just tried to go through the stuff that I had read by, yes, um, by today's Tuesday. So yeah, by yesterday morning, I guess, or Sunday night um, to, uh, to come up with like what seemed reasonable. And I used the Vermont Planners Association memo a lot. Um, I used, I read, most of the other letters of, that had a very much of the same um, conversations in it. And so what I was able to provide to you will be um, a starting point. It's the way I look at it. And we'll see how we do. So um, anything else? And, and Chip, I thought Little Pink Houses was a John Mellencamp song. It is, but that's the vision that I have seeing all these housing developments, one of which my uncle lived in and we used to visit him, but just just rows and rows of houses, the same exact houses built on farmland that had grown tomatoes shortly before these developments. Okay. Oh, Representative Howard. Earhart, nice. in our committee, Earhart, in our committee, we use our, our blue hand. Yeah. Representative Howard. Sorry if I'm mumbling. The Novocaine is wearing off for my dental uh, surgery this morning. So, um, but I wanted to first thank Jeff Wemberg for come for taking part in this discussion. Um, I would also um, like to mention that I live across from Hickory Place. And I walk my dog there every day. In fact, Brody is now the mayor of Hickory Place. The people are just, you know, so friendly and so nice. They have their community garden. They have a little uh, book exchange. Um, it just is an incredible neighborhood. It is not pink houses. They're all a little different. I live in a development where the houses are different. There are, there's a, a couple of duplexes, there's uh, the single home, one level, two level, which is great. So I, um, I, I think um, um, I, I am in support of this bill. I think it's necessary. I lived in Rutland Town also where there is no zoning and you can pretty much do whatever you want in Rutland Town. Uh, so I, I really, uh, I really think this is important, and I uh, look forward to discussing it more tomorrow when I feel better. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's that. You, you did really well there without with the no uh, king wearing off. Um, 
Earhart, uh, Earhart, I don't know what you're going to say, but I will say, I will ask you, you did post some links that if you could send them in an email, because once we get done with this hearing, we won't see them any, ever again. So if you could send the committee um, or, you know, send the committee a, uh, an email, that would be great. Or send it to me and I'll forward them to uh, the committee. But please go right ahead. Well, happy, uh, happy to do that, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, just wanted to draw people's attention to them. Uh, Representative Troiano's uh, the uh, reference to little uh, little pink houses uh, just reminded me of the resources that I uh, mentioned during my testimony, uh, especially the the film owned A Tale of Two Americas and uh, Julie Campoli's book on visualizing density. So I'll I'll send those along. Uh, but yeah, um, that was pretty much all I wanted to draw attention to. Thanks, thanks again for your time. Great. No, thank you. And um, thank you, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. All right. Have a good night. Ariana, is that a new hairdo for you? Thanks. Yeah. Looks cool. <laughs> <laughs>